have to begin occupying territory on the Chinese side of LAC so that we have we are in a in a position to negotiate something uh, by way of give and take. Uh, now it's all give. What's there to negotiate? And therefore the Chinese are saying, well, what the heck, we are not going to talk unless you vacate the Rishangla Ridge. Isn't that? That's their position. That Taiwan is China's Pakistan. Use it. Let's have nuclear technology relationship with Taiwan. Why? Because they are almost on the point of becoming a nuclear power. Again, like the Americans pressuring India not to become a nuclear weapons power, they succeeded in stopping uh, their um, nuclear weapons uh, program. We have to begin to countering China in absolutely the same equal measure that they discomfort us and they react to us and act against us in our interests. This is what Indian government has to do. The Prime Minister can change this. He can tomorrow order, reorder the government of India into how it should be, where there is complete and absolute coordination. Here the, you know, the trouble is, for instance, we talk of intelligence, which is important. There are so many intelligence agencies, there is no coordination. Ladies and gentlemen, for the first episode of the Chanakya Dialogues, it's my proud privilege to introduce to you Mr. Bharat Karnad. Mr. Bharat Karnad was responsible for writing India's nuclear doctrine. He's an academician, he's a thinker, and more importantly, he is a policymaker, has been part of the National Security Council. Sir, Jai Hind, and a very warm welcome to Ashosa. Jai Hind, Major. Sir, uh, so my first question to you is this. The entire world is extremely cautious about what they say as far as China is concerned. Uh, there is always this fear that China will feel bad about something, the way China will react. Can you take us down history a little bit, sir, in a few minutes? Why has this reputation of China been built over a period of decades? That you know, China is something which is insidious, China is something that is great, China is something which is inscrutable, China is something that you cannot understand, and China is something which has to be feared. Where does this reputation come from, sir? Well, basically, because I think uh, since 1979 and the full modernizations program that Deng Xiaoping uh, set in motion in China, uh, China has become an economic powerhouse. Now, what that does is uh, that it, you know, it, it allows the tentacles, the Chinese tentacles to spread all over the world in terms of global trade, commerce and uh, presence, generally political presence. So uh, this is what Beijing has uh, both exploited and capitalized on uh, over these past uh, three, three and a half odd decades. And three and a half decades since the 1979 modernization program got fully under steam. It took them about 10 years to get on track. And then they have been uh, really uh, going at a very fast rate uh, until now when the latest prognostication is uh, that uh, it'll be the premier economy in, in the world by 1928. This was expected to happen 10 years later. Uh, they have, uh, so they have preponed their preeminence, uh, their rise to preeminence by almost a decade. This is really quite extraordinary. And I think it's the um, basis for their rocketing rise in the world. And the reason why no one really wants to upset them alienate to Beijing, because one way or the other, uh, Beijing now has the leverage to make them suffer. So that's a very good negative leverage to have, that if you don't behave as we expect you to, uh, you will be in trouble. Uh, so my next question to you is, what can the world do to arrest this rise? Because uh, China taking pole position, being number one in the world, will have serious consequences for the rest of the world, which practices promotes free speech democracy, because we know how the Chinese are. What can we do to get our act together and stop this rise to power of China? Well, let's be clear uh, in terms of being realistic. We cannot stop China's rise. What we can do is try and blunt the hard edges that China will bring to interstate relations, to the global power politics, etc. 
The question is whether we can contain them to remain peaceful. As they always said that the rice has been peaceful, it's really not the case. They have been very coercive and it's the coercion that has worked for them. Um, but that said, I think it is um, also re realistic to, uh, to say that no single country can do it, not the United States on its own or Western Europe or anybody else. Uh, it will have to be a collective effort. Now, in Asia, I think the uh, quadrilateral has been talked about, as you are well aware, now, except it has an extraterritorial power, which is really not reliable as a pillar of this particular partnership, a quadrilateral, and that's the United States. It's not reliable, and therefore, we'll have to think up an arrangement. And I've been advocating that instead of the United States, we should have a group of Southeast Asian countries uh, banding together uh, and, and then joining the other members of the Quad, um, Japan, India, and Australia, uh, to have an architecture, a security architecture that's organic to Asia. United States can come in or not, as it wishes at any given time, as it, it will invariably do, because it's an extraterritorial balancer uh, that can balance from afar. It's what it has always done. It will not want to get into a conflict uh, situation for the sake of uh, some other country. And this is the fact that I've been stressing for almost 20, 25 years now, that it's not that the US means ill, it's just that its interests are not as directly engaged as those of the Asian countries in China's vicinity uh, and proximal to China. And that's what I think we need to be uh, very, very concerned about. And this is what we need to obtain by way of a security coalition uh, or arrangement, a loose security arrangement, not a NATO type uh, tight tightly knit one uh, with all kinds of uh, structures, etc. And sure. that's very, very feasible. And that could then translate into the trade and commerce sphere as well. Sure. Uh, I'd like to ask you about China's internal structures, uh, China's internal uh, uh, you know, policies and the way they execute things. Because uh, uh, what China has been doing is by using of force, using its economy, uh, it has had to my mind, a transactional relationship with its own citizens, so that we will give you economic prosperity and you will keep your mouth shut. Uh, my, my basic, uh, the premise on which I am I'm asking you this question, sir, is that uh, do you think it's possible to shake up China's internal structures? Where are the fault lines in China? Because we've seen lots of pro-democracy movements in China, and obviously China is very afraid. I mean, Twitter does not work in China, sir. Facebook doesn't work in China. And none of the Western social media platforms work in China. And this is not because uh, Chinese love uh, indigenous platforms. It's just that they're too scared to hear the opinions of their own people. Do you think this is a serious fault line in China, sir? Well, that is one of the fault lines. But the more uh, basic and I think uh, social cultural fault line is the ethnic division within China between the main Han 92% a population that are that constituted by the Han people and the rest are minorities, chief among them the Uyghurs in Xinjiang and the Tibetans in Tibet. Now, these are the fault lines that uh, we should really exploit, especially Tibet, and no harm in recognizing uh, the Uyghurs as and what they call the East Turkestan Freedom Movement. Um, and, and, and help them materially, morally and otherwise uh, to get going. Uh, we have been extremely, and, and that's even more so vis-a-vis -vis the Tibetan freedom movement. I think we really have to be more um, upfront and perhaps lead the charge, as it were, in, in, in trying to restore to the Tibetans their a free country that's theirs. Now, the entire exile community in India is really their, their entire uh, the ideology, the basis of life, as it were, uh, a political life in any case, uh, is you know, is dependent on obtaining a free Tibet for them to go back to. And that's what we need to really further. Now, those are the social cultural things that we haven't really exploited at all because we have felt so deterred and coerced by what the Chinese might do in return that we haven't even responded when they have, uh, you know, in a sense, fueled the fissiparous tendencies in the Northeast by financially and uh, materially supporting various you know, rebel movements and uh, insurgent uh, movements in the Northeast, in Manipur, in Nagaland and elsewhere. Now, 
if you're not even willing to have a tit for tat, uh, what, why would you then, why would a government, Indian government, risk so, uh, so much more by, uh, by being in the forefront of the, the Tibetan freedom cause? So this is really, uh, you know, um, really disturbing because India doesn't really seem to realize its own best interests or the vital interest that India has in having a buffer, which is why, uh, which is what Tibet served as for millennia. Tibet was the buffer and um, it, it, it was so much more. It was a source of all the water. Now that's being dammed, etc. We may wish to talk about that. So, you know, China has put itself in the driver's seat and um, we seem as the frontline country vis-a-vis uh, -vis China, landward side, we seem to be reacting in a very pusillanimous fashion, a weak and uh, mindless fashion. And that I think we need to uh, get out of that attitude and do something uh, more substantive in our own interest. Uh, sir, my next question is more rhetorical than a real question, sir. Because uh, this is what I feel very strongly. Uh, the world has never taken on China ever properly. China has never been called to account for its uh, very many sins. And uh, nobody's actually taken a stand against China. What, what Donald Trump did was, I mean, fractured in many ways, sir. He was known as a temperamental person who would uh, say one thing today and something else the next day. But, uh, but the world hasn't really come together to take on China, sir. Uh, do you think this has also fueled China's rise and that feeling in the Chinese mind that we are indestructible and nobody will oppose us because it's never been done in a coherent manner before? Well, the point I think is China wouldn't have risen, risen as it has and so fast. Uh, without America's central help, as you well know. Uh, the uh, Shanghai Declaration um, uh, with the uh, uh, Nixon, when Nixon visited China and then, then the rapprochement between the two countries, in, between America and China began and really got going. Uh, it was based on precisely the kind of uh, uh, thing that the Americans wanted and had hoped that a more open China uh, and China open to economic uh, commerce and exchanges, etc., would be a would be a, a system that would become freer. Uh, what they didn't realize, uh, Kissinger and all those great strategists who, uh, you know, in a sense, nurse made it, this uh, particular policy in Washington, is that the Chinese system is built on a hierarchical Confucian system uh, of uh, you know very strict uh, obedience. Uh, and 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 uh, the communist uh, ideology and the system that Mao Zedong and his cohort brought into China fit very nicely into the uh, Confucian notions. And uh, this is a traditional thing. And it's not just in China; it's in the states bordering China. As you know, they're called the little dragons, not for nothing, because they also hew and adhere to the Confucian tenets, which really respects hierarchy, which uh, pays obeisance to the, the powerful uh, in the hope that they too will become powerful and, be, and will be paid obeisance too in turn. So this is the ideology that China has uh, been driven by and uh, which is uh, now finding expression. The point I think is that um, the rest of the world has to reckon with this aspect of China, that it is so hard driven by its vision of itself uh, that nothing can stop it. Because in real terms, uh, the, uh, you, you can either cut off China, which you can't do, because it is trade-wise and economically so uh, interlinked with the rest of the world. They have managed to do so, very strategically, great foresight. Uh, and for countries to disengage uh, would cost them dearly in terms of uh, their own economic um, growth, the rate of growth, the uh, rise of the export industries, etc. They have, you know, what China has done is amalgamated states in the in, in widening circles around China in their specific supply chain, global supply chain, economically, and that makes them dependent on China. So they're not going to join you in in opposing uh, whatever China wants to do, as long as it rhetorically maintains the kind of uh, peaceful uh, intent and professes 
to be a, a, a very benign hegemon, even if it becomes a very powerful country, it says they mean no ill, etc. Uh, this is a problem that we all have to face, and there is, there is no easy solution. So our reaction, India's reaction post Galwan, uh, honestly, I think it is too little, too late, sir. Uh, in terms of uh, you know banning mobile phone apps, that is that is one part. I don't know how much it is actually hurt China or not hurt China, I'm not aware. But what would you think would be a proper response? Because India says that it is a rising superpower. Do you think it's high time we started behaving like a rising superpower? And the next part of my question is, sir, there's been talk of giving BrahMos missiles to Vietnam. And we are forever thinking, thinking, thinking. And uh, there is this, you know, they say that too much of analysis leads to paralysis. And uh, I think this is very true of how India functions. There is just too much of thinking and too little action. Uh, what are your views on this, sir? Oh, absolutely. Uh, let me start by answering your last question first, because that's very dear to my heart. Uh, in, in 1998, when I was the member of the first National Security Advisory Board, the then Foreign Secretary K. Raghunath came before us. And I asked him, why is it that we haven't considered giving... Uh, you know, replying and responding to the Chinese transfer of nuclear missiles and technologies, material and expertise to Pakistan by like action, by transferring uh, without let or hindrance um, strategic technologies to states on China's periphery. And Mr. Raghunath told the entire NSAB in, uh, in a plenary session uh, that, uh, well, it's not practicable. I still remember the word not practicable. How is it not practicable? to respond to your, the, the adversary's actions against you in like manner. Now, if the MEA and the Foreign Service and our diplomats and the entire government, therefore, thinks this way, are you surprised that we still haven't reacted to that basic strategic discomforting action the Chinese took as far back as um, the uh, mid-1970s to nuclear missile arm Pakistan? No, this is the first thing we should have done. Uh, to pass on the nuclear missiles. If you do not have the guts for it, then at least prioritize passing on the BrahMos conventionally armed missiles to all the countries that required it and do it on a friendship basis and give it as a first priority. You don't need to arm yourself first. Arm these countries first because they are the first line of defense, as it were, for India. That's how we have to begin thinking strategically. Now, uh, and, but as you say, we have delayed and dallied and, you know, there are all kinds of uh, councils within the government to uh, urging caution and um, these are basically Mandarin speaking the sinologists in various services whether it's intel our intelligence whether it's in the diplomatic service uh, these are people who keep cautioning um, the government not to do uh, these kinds of things that I've been recommending for three you know almost two and a half decades now um, the other thing you, you uh, talked about was uh, the the response to that is really the what we have done is just ban the apps and so on without really banning the major capital equipment uh, sales and purchases that our agencies keep making from China. We keep say, thinking that somehow Huawei is not in the running still, but there are still uh, agencies within the government, starting with the BSNL, uh, that keep ham hankering for the Huawei uh, you know, uh, systems uh, to advance the fourth generation uh, telecom that they hope to do. And they promise that, well, for the fifth generation, we'll go elsewhere. That doesn't make sense. <clears throat> um, but when we talk about, in a sense, separating the governments, separating uh, India from uh, distancing India from China with uh, banning the apps or something, this is really very trivial stuff. Something more has to be done because we are fallen into the neo-colonial trap of trade. We send them uh, natural resources, uh, leather, jewels, this, that, and the other minerals, uh, etc., and they send us back uh, finished products. This is the perfect Manchester model from the British colonial days. So we really have to get out of this awfully unequal, unfair uh, pattern of trade that we have acquiesced in over the years. Um, so you said, post Galwan, what should we have done? Well, primarily, I mean, I, I suppose you'll get into, want to get into this, but in the military field, you know, 
what have we done that is in the least offensive minded? The one thing we have done is really occupy posts in our own territory on the Rizangla ridge line, and we think it's a great offensive action. By you know, by preemptive the PLA from coming in and taking our post, we say we have done a great thing. Now, what about you know taking real offensive action in terms of vacating the PLA from uh, fingers uh, three to eight on the Pangong Zoo, or uh, you know vacating the blockade that the PLA has imposed on the Y Junction that gives us access to our territory in the Depsang Plains, which if we don't get the access, that territory uh, amounting to some thousand square kilometers stays lost, which basically means the Chinese then will absorb it, or it's already in their, uh, you know, in, in their grasp. So that's the sort of thing we need to do. But there are people here who argue, and I'm, I'm sorry to see that some very senior military people including uh, General H.S. Panag and others have, are talking about, uh, in some fashion, our Zangla action as uh, proving to be a great deterrent uh, to, uh, and, and, and making uh, impression on the Chinese. The Chinese are just biding their time. Xi Jinping may, at this moment in time, be a little uncertain about what he means to do. But do you think that once the spring time rolls around, and the snows melt, they're going to remain at their passive defensive uh, posture, or are they going to convert that into something more meaningful? And shouldn't we be the ones to do it? Uh, and I hope we can talk a little bit more on the military options, uh, if you wish. Uh, sir, coming to the military options and sort of expanding on it, uh, would you also recommend counter intrusion? Because uh, if you're on the negotiating table, you can't say that the Chinese are breathing down our necks and let's negotiate because it doesn't make sense to negotiate like that. So yes. are you also recommending counter intrusion into China and say that now let's negotiate? Are you saying that? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, what, are you going, what negotiating cards do you have when you sit down, whether at the Moldo post to Shul, Moldo post or whatever, the, you know, the yakking that goes on, yakking sessions that make no sense because you know, the real hard stuff that gets talked about in a few minutes, but it takes 10 hours at a time because there's all kinds of translation, etc. And they, 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 they act as if they don't know the English language. They perfectly know what you're saying. They just want to delay it because they think time is on their side. That's the Chinese negotiating strategy. And that's the great skill in thinking of time as being their ally, which is not, we are always in a haste to make this, you know, to come to conclusions. And you're absolutely right. We have to begin occupying territory on the Chinese side of LAC so that we, have, we are in a, in a position to negotiate something uh, by way of give and take. Uh, now it's all give. What's there to negotiate? And therefore the Chinese are saying, well, what the heck? We are not going to talk unless you vacate the Rizangla Ridge. Isn't it? That's their position. And they say, well, let's have a... Uh, a standstill agreement on the Pangong Zoo. How can you have a Pangong Zoo st standstill agreement when you already occupied the bulk of it and left us less than uh, three fingers in the mountainous uh, terrain that are called the fingers, as you know. Uh, and actually, we have just the, uh, the first two, finger one and finger two. Finger three is where they're already on. And they are saying, well, okay, you know, we have withdrawn some. While well, on the ridge line, they're right there. They can come in any time. So uh, this, is, this has to stop. This defensive, passive defensive uh, posture of ours, stance of ours vis-a-vis -vis China has to stop. And uh, I, I'm not sure why it is that it has gone so deep into our psyche, our military psyche, as well as our civilian government psyche, that we don't even wish to contemplate the options that we have. And we have them. There are, you know, it's not everywhere that the PLA is strong and uh, or equally strong. They cannot be. There's too long a border and they don't have the kind of forces, etc. So we ought to begin to think in terms of being proactive in going forward, occupying posts, building up, and then, um, you know, talking to China or not talking to China. That's, a, that's our call if that doesn't shoot our purposes. Absolutely, sir. Uh now, I want to talk to you about Taiwan, because uh, Taiwan has been making the right noises. And uh, Taiwan says that uh, while we may be a small small piece of land, 
just off the coast of China. They refuse to be cowed down, sir. And, China, and uh, Taiwan has shown tremendous character. You will agree, sir. What can we do to strengthen Taiwan? What can we do diplomatically, politically, economically, and militarily to strengthen Taiwan and make the partnership better? In my 2015 book, Why India is Not a Great Power Yet, uh, published by the Oxford University Press, I'm going to some detail about, uh, you know, in a sense, elevating our relations with Taiwan to a full-fledged diplomatic uh, status, according it full-fledged uh, diplomatic status. Um, what we have right now is so-called a trade council here in Delhi, which is basically an, an embassy. And I remember many years back, almost 10, 15 years ago, uh, my meeting with the then Taiwanese ambassador in Delhi, and the kind of offers they were making then, they may not make any more, uh, but is that they said, we'll get rid of your national debt. You just recognize us. Let us fly our flag, Taiwanese flag. That's all. Just recognize us. We'll wipe out your national debt. I mean, and the kinds of things they have on offer, that is one country that has completely penetrated the Chinese military intelligence and their cyber grid, more importantly. If, and they've said, you do this, we'll give you the entire mapped out cyber grid of China, which means then we'll be able to mount very easily the kind of offensive, proactive, preemptive uh, cyber offensive actions to knock out the Chinese firewalls and get deep into their system. The Taiwanese have that capability. They use it all the time, but they're not going to give it to you for nothing. And this is what is not you know, either appreciated or understood. What is it that we get from China? I mean, they are supporting and upkeeping and propping up Pakistan. Uh, on the other hand, we have, uh, you know, um, uh, not responded in kind because I've argued that Taiwan is China's Pakistan. Use it. Let's have nuclear technology relationship with Taiwan. Why? Because they are almost on the point of becoming a nuclear power. Again, like the Americans pressuring India not to become a nuclear weapons power, they succeeded in stopping uh, their um, nuclear weapons uh, program uh, because they were too much beholden to the United States at the time. Uh, they allowed it to happen, but they have kept a secret program going and should shall push come to shove, they'll become a nuclear power and we should help them in every way possible. Why not help test a Taiwanese um, nuclear explosive, uh, you know, the device in, in Pokhran? Why? The Chinese let the pa Pakistanis test the Chinese designed Pakistani device in Lopnor. We have to begin to countering China in absolutely the same equal measure that they discomfit us and they react to us and act against us in our interests. This is what Indian government has to do. But we keep thinking that if we don't do it, the, the, the shall we say, returns on it will be bigger for India. Chinese are not idiots. They have been strategic minded for millennia. We unfortunately have been, you know, we can't look beyond our noses. Absolutely. So what I hear you saying is that uh, uh, if India wants to be a superpower, it's high time it started behaving like one. And uh, other, otherwise, there is no uh, there is no going forward on this. My last question to you, sir, is something that all the senior people have complained about privately, though they don't want to speak about it, uh, speak about this publicly, is that organizations and departments and agencies don't seem to get along. And they say that this is one reason why there is no coherent response against China or Pakistan for that matter. So if we have our intelligence agencies and we have our armed forces and we have our foreign policy mandarins and everybody seems to be on their own page, driving their own uh, agenda may not be a right word, but whatever their narrow concept of a thing is. Like, for example, this entire uh, East Ladakh thing that is unraveling in front of us today. Do you think there is scope for a more cohesive response, what we call jointness in the army, though it is for the Army, Navy and Air Force, but jointness across the national power profile, sir, across the national power profile? Do you think that should be done? No, absolutely. It has to be imposed by law if necessary. 
the rules of business of each ministry is really ridiculous. They end up making each ministry and agency of government sovereign. Do you know that? In terms of functionality. This is really ridiculous because when the prime minister says something and lays down the law or at least the policy line, and again, these are very generalized lines, right? Then each ministry is free to interpret the prime ministerial directive in its own way. There's no central agency saying, well, this is what it means. And this is what this ministry, you, you, you have to do this, that and the other. Nothing is laid down. So each ministry feels, as you said, uh, ends up defining its own agenda within the parameters of what they think the prime minister said. Now, this is really problematic because unlike in Beijing, say China, whom we are dealing with, where there's the central Politburo, there's she, of course, at the top, uh, virtually an emperor of China. Then there's the uh, Politburo and various um, groups within it. But militarily, there's a central military commission where everything gets filtered through that one unitary, you know, that unitary purpose is then conveyed to all the theater commanders down the line in exact terms. They have no freedom to uh, vacillate or depart from that line or they'll be, they'll get a shot in the head. You know, there's no, and here we have everybody acting in silo fashion. Each secretary of government thinks he's the king and he is, he's sovereign. You know, whatever the prime minister might say, who can change this? The prime minister can change this. He can tomorrow order, reorder the government of India into how it should be, where there's complete and absolute coordination. Here, the, you know, the trouble is, for instance, we talk of intelligence, which is important. There's so many intelligence agencies, there's no coordination. And, and you know, where China is concerned, for instance, they all tap into the same sources and give very different interpretation, which is really ridiculous. But this is the kind of thing we have lived with for years together. And, and we think this is normal. This is not normal. There has to be a central agency. That's why in America, there is director central intelligence and national intelligence. One, one guy, one source. Therefore, the stovepipe decision-making, policy-making has to end. It can end by the rules of business being uh, you know, rewritten in plain, simple terms to say, well, this is what needs to be done. And this is where the orders are going to come from. And this is how things are going to proceed hereafter. No government to date has done that, which is why you know, we go off in you know, a thousand different directions and we end up not being at all effective. Thank you very much uh, for your time, sir. It was lovely speaking with you. I learned a lot and I'm sure so did my audience, sir. And we look forward to having you back on Chanakya Dialogues in the near future for another interesting program. Ladies and gentlemen, with uh, Mr. Bharat Karnad on the Chanakya Dialogues for Chanakya Forum. Uh, we spoke about a lot of things uh, about the rise of China, why India's decision making is almost paralyzed, how we seem to function in silos and how when we do things, it is too late and never enough. We'll come back next week with another episode of the Chanakya Dialogues. Stay with us. Thank you for joining in and Jai Hind.